Mark Riddell. I'm a professor here in uh, interactive computing. Um, I've also been a principal research scientist at Salesforce Research, where I've had uh, the distinct pleasure of working alongside, although not directly with, uh, Brian McCann. Uh, Brian McCann has been a uh, senior research scientist at uh, Salesforce Research, which is kind of a little um, think tank of AI research. They write a lot of papers and do things, and I've been able to see Brian and some of his colleagues do amazing top quality research there over the last eight months or so. Brian has been, um, he got his BS and master's from Stanford and joined Salesforce Research shortly after their um, very expensive aqua hire by Salesforce Research. So he's been kind of at ground zero since that. And um, he's here to talk about some very cool stuff on multitask learning, especially in natural language processing. I don't want to steal his thunder, so I'll just kind of hand it over to him. So thank you very much. Cool. Well, I guess I'll just echo some of the, uh, the thanks. So thanks for, for coming, everybody, um, giving me the chance to talk about some of the research I've been working on. As uh, Mark mentioned, and thanks, Mark, too, for, for bringing me and for introdu introducing me. Uh, uh, I've been working on multitask learning, uh, specifically in the context of NLP. Um, before that, I had done some work on transfer learning, uh, doing like something called like contextualized word vectors using machine translation systems and transferring that to uh, other NLP tasks like question answering. Um, but after that, we moved right into just trying to get systems that um, work on many different NLP tasks at once. So I'll just dive right in. Uh, and you know, if you, if you have questions, actually just feel free to interrupt me. Um, but Hopefully there'll be plenty of time after. Uh, my contact info is on there. Feel free to reach out um, if you have questions or feedback of any kind. Uh, and hopefully, eventually these slides will be online um, if you want to ping me about that as well. So just as a motivational slide here for, for this kind of work, um, at Salesforce Research, uh, the way that we've been thinking about it, or, or some of the trends that we've seen, so we started uh, a while back with you know, machine learning and the power of, of feature engineering. And we realized that when we moved to deep learning um, and kind of got rid of some of the hand, hand engineering of those features, we made substantial progress. Um, but deep learning has continued to get a little bit better, better and better, by basically turning into architecture engineering for single tasks. Uh, like given a data set, given a task, we're quite good at, as a community at um, kind of mastering that task. So we were asking ourselves, you know, what's, what's going to be next for NLP, maybe for AI as well, um, or at least, at the very least, what's kind of one of the blockers um, for, for making substantial progress? So to us, single task learning seemed to have some, 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 blocking, some blocking limits there. So we've been able to reach uh, you know, great performance um, like I said, given a, a data set for a specific task, uh, we can usually put some people on it, they can come up with a model, and as long as you have like a metric that you can optimize and it's close enough to what you really want, uh, we're very good at that. We can hill climb, you know, as long as the data is big enough. And uh, let's see, so this is a cute little picture of like a dog, you know, because every time we get a new task, uh, we tend to have to start over. There's some maybe transfer and some high level conceptual space about how we're designing architectures and some intuition that is just passed on as a craft amongst us. Um, but really, we want to push towards a single model uh, that's learning many things, diverse set of tasks, uh, perhaps even continuously as well. Um, so instead of just starting from random or maybe starting from some of the pre-trained methods that we've developed in recent years, um, we want to move towards that single model setup. In computer vision, you know, we saw ImageNet, CNNs uh, lead to huge success. Um, and it turns out that just by doing image classification, you could get all these useful features for other kinds of vision tasks. NLP, we took a little bit longer. You know, we had WordDevec, we had Glove, uh, Cove, which is the contextualized vectors that I had worked on. Um, and then Elmo, uh, for those who haven't heard, it's like a language modeling version of pre-training uh, encoders and then transferring the outputs of those encoders rather than just the word embeddings themselves. 
And this, is, this has been interesting because it seems to suggest that we're moving up the hierarchy and the, um, the kinds of parameters we can share, the kinds of representations we're learning how to transfer. But it still seems like there's no single blocking task. You know, the way that doing image classification just gave us things that were great for everything else in vision. Uh, it seems like, well, kind of doing uh, co-occurrence statistics is useful. Learning machine translation is useful. Learning language modeling is useful. Uh, question answering, there, are like, there have been many papers on this about now question answering is useful, constituency parsing is useful, natural language inference. We can kind of take these representations and transfer them to other tasks. Um, so why were we, why did it kind of take so long to get this going? And uh, why is it still not quite where uh, vision was um, even a few years ago? Is it because NLP requires many types of reasoning? Um, this could be one reason. Maybe we need different kinds of short and long-term memory that uh, haven't been required for certain kinds of vision tasks. Um, it's possible that it's because NLP has been divided uh, into many separate distinct tasks that kind of, well, maybe this, this boundary is just artificial. And uh, really, we're, we're working on specific tasks that are really related in this language space. But because we treat them as individual distinct things, uh, we don't tend to make some of the connections and modeling space that uh, we want to. Um, and maybe it's just because language seems to require a lot of supervision in a way that uh, each of these tasks really does need its own kind of data and, and uh, the learning process is just different. Well, what we wanted to try was making a single multitask model to, to ask this question and to, to get at this. Um, we tend to think that this is something that is needed for a truly general NLP model. You know, if, if it can't do multiple things, if it can't summarize what it understands and answer questions about it and even translate it, um, then what does it really understand? Uh, it turns out that just on the production side, you know, in industry, if you did have a single model that could do these things, uh, deployment becomes much easier because now anytime you have a new task that comes in, well, you can just run this model kind of as a, a standard baseline, the way that you might do logistic regression on certain kinds of data. Well, this is a very general model that you could run on a much broader set of tasks. Uh, just as a simple baseline just to get started, and you could fine tune it, maybe use a lot of multitask learning data. Um, and part of the beauty of this is that it also lowers the bar for anybody who wants to to work in NLP. You know, if you, if you really had a multitask model that you just needed to kind of port over to a new task, uh, that makes it much easier for, for people to get started. Um, and one of our specif specifications here was that we wanted to stay away from the, uh, the way that we had seen people hand engineering features before. We wanted to move away from hand engineering how knowledge should be transferred or even represented amongst tasks. You know, we wanted to remove uh, as much bias as possible while still being successful in the tasks. Um, and this setting uh, provides you know, a good environment for studying all sorts of uh, different perspectives on, on this kind of common problem of domain adaptation and transfer learning how to get models to truly generalize, do zero-shot learning, um, things like that. The problem is that in NLP, there, there really are just a lot of different tasks. Uh, lots of people doing multitask learning have done um, either many different kinds of classification tasks or maybe different kinds of languages in like multilingual translation. Um, but the kinds of tasks that exist in NLP really um, push the limits of what any single architecture was, was shown to do in the past. Uh, you know, question answering systems, uh, for those who are familiar with multiple of these, like question answering systems often look quite a bit different from machine translation. They share components, but there are some key things that get question answering systems to look different. Uh, for example, a lot of them tend to just copy from a context document, and they're not able to actually generate text, or when you do, uh, you lose a lot in performance. Um, with dialogue or common sense reasoning, especially semantic parsing, where you're converting something to you know, a formal language, in our case, SQL, these architectures tend to look kind of different. And 
even with things like classification, um, it's not clear how we would really get that to work with a machine translation system or summarization and how to switch between these. And our thinking was that there are kind of three general approaches to NLP that we think could theoretically solve this. Um, you can think of these as general approaches or super tasks, uh, whatever you want. But we were thinking in terms of language modeling, question answering, or dialogue. And in this work, we focus on the question answering part. And I'll just explain a little bit why. Um, to us at the time, dialogue seemed kind of like iterative question answering. You know, if you had a really good general question answering system, maybe with some memory attached to it or something like that, you could just run it iteratively and, and have yourself a dialogue system, especially with dialogue being one of the tasks under consideration. Language modeling, on the other hand, is a little bit uh, uh, maybe less going in like a different direction here. Um, it seems like you could frame everything as language modeling in some sense and get the same effects, especially if you do something like frame everything as question answering first and then do language modeling with that. If you could predict the next word, you could just read a document, read the question in sequence, and then hopefully just predict the answer word by word. No one's shown how to do that, but maybe in some sense you could. So for us, question answering seemed uh, maybe the most viable in terms of systems that we understood, uh, seemed pretty useful for things at the time, and we thought that was a good starting point. So going back to these these tasks, and these are the, the 10 tasks that are part of the Natural Language Decathlon, which is the, the work that I'm presenting here. Um, our focus was to move from supervised learning uh, pairs of like X and Y, inputs and outputs, to including the task description in our NLP model. Um, maybe a similar move to things you've seen like meta-learning or, or other kind of approaches uh, to these kinds of problems. Um, and here, we use a question uh, as the natural description for T. So we don't want to use a task ID. Um, we don't really want to have like a specific switch for a specific task because that again goes back to, okay, well, we have this kind of task and when our model works on that task, it's gonna run in this kind of way. And then when we do this task, we're gonna do it in this kind of way. But if we see a new task, now we kind of have to choose, but it's not clear which one. Are you able to do completely new things? Uh, these are the kinds of things we wanted to get out of our model, so we didn't want to bias it up front to have these uh, any sort of task-specific behavior. And uh, Y, of course, is the answer to Q. And in our case, um, X is a context that's necessary to answer Q and get Y. And these are some examples of how we transformed those 10 tasks I was showing before into this question-answering format. So you can think of question answering here as just like our interface into all these different tasks. Uh, so the first, the first couple examples show uh, you know, an example of question answering where you're, you're given a document, uh, you're given a question, you answer it. That's pretty straightforward. Um, something that's kind of more interesting to note here is that we do, we're doing the same thing with classification. So when we say, like, is this sentence positive or negative, our model actually outputs the word positive or negative. It doesn't output like, uh, I mean, it's obviously outputting like an ID that is eventually mapped to that word, but it's a generative process the way that you would think of normal sequential generation of text. Um, yeah? Is there variability in those questions? Like, is, like uh, is um, uh, sentiment classification always posed as, is this sentence positive or negative, or are there, is it grammatical variability? Yeah, so this is a great question. Um, so there, and there are kind of two answers. In the original work uh, that we put out, and like if you look at the paper the way it is now, things like these, these questions are fixed for tasks like sentiment. They're obviously varying for question answering. Question's always different. Um, and things like uh, natural language inference, so it's different. Uh, common sense reasoning, it'll differ. Uh, for a few of them, they'll differ. But for a few of them, they're fixed. And then the second part of the answer is that we then followed up on that. And um, we've now been experimenting with different variations. And maybe just uh, to jump on that right now, like with sentiment and a few of the other ones, you definitely don't lose performance. I haven't seen anything lost. You might even gain a little bit. 
I'm actually in the middle of experiments that are running right now trying to determine whether there's like a real benefit beyond just making the model robust to different inputs. Um, like, can we actually get it to, to do something different? So you yeah. The first part where they are fixed, then that input is isomorphic to a task. I so. Exactly. Exactly. It's, well, kind of. It's almost. Um, it is in the sense of how the model might be working internally, but hopefully I'll have some examples at the end that show how framing it as these words that are actually uh, read in and then generated might you know, motivate a little bit of this future work or current work I'm doing on rephrasing the questions. So we'll, we'll hopefully get to that. But definitely keep that in mind. Um, yeah. I, I mentioned most of this, but uh, you know, so we didn't want any task-specific modules or parameters because uh, we didn't want a task ID, even though the questions in the formulation originally sometimes did ask, act as a task ID. Um, and we wanted to kind of learn how to adjust to different tasks on its own. We wanted that to be learned behavior so that it can possibly do new tasks without us telling it how they relate to old tasks. So. I'm going to jump into a model section now. Um, basically, we have uh, something we called a multitask question answering network. And if you're familiar with seek to seek models or question answering models that already exist, a lot of these components will look similar. Um, and there are a few things that are kind of important for how we put it together uh, that I'll highlight along the way. But the high level overview is that we're starting with a context, we ask a question, and we generate the answer one word at a time. Uh, like with an autoregressive decoder. And uh, when we're generating those words, we have three choices we can make. We can copy from the context, uh, we can copy from the question, uh, or we can choose from an external vocabulary. And uh, in this diagram, uh, there's the big model thing, and then there's a pointer switch here, and that's, um, it's a softly learned distribution over these, these choices here. So this is all, uh, there are no hard decisions here. So I'm just going to dig right into this. Um, but it's all open sourced. Uh, all the code for training the tasks, you know, all the model, even um, when I'm lazy, some of like the current stuff I'm working on will be up there if you want to keep tabs on it. Um, but for now, uh, we'll kind of dig in. And then if there are any ambiguities, feel free to ask me or just reference the code if you're actually using it in the future. Good question. Yeah. So in some tasks, like question answering or Uh -huh. asked to pick one of them. Mm -hmm. like, and maybe you'll get to this, but is that just simply embedded as part of the context that you have to deal with, or like, is that handled separately? Um, so I guess in the case, uh, I'll, I'll try to see if I understand exactly what you're asking. Like a but multiple choice question answering. Yeah, choice. yeah. So that those options would be embedded somehow in the context or the question. So in the case of the question being, is the sentence positive or negative? In, those, in that case, the, op the answer options are embedded in the question. right? And then in some cases, they're embedded in the, in the context. So actually, if I back up here to these, in this, in this figure, um, words that are in red are coming from the context. And that's where the model decided, using its uh, pointer switch, to point to some sequence of words in the context and copy. Blue are generated from the external vocabulary, and green are copied from the question. Um, yeah. So let's dig into this, and we'll kind of we'll start at the beginning, um, and I'll get into some gory details, uh, but I'll I'll breeze over it fairly quickly. So feel free to um, you know not care about all of it, but if you do, ask me. So we start out we started out with fixed glove and character angram embeddings. Um, this is actually interesting if you think about it later. Uh, and we'll see some of the effects of, of this decision. We didn't train the embeddings, um, partially because we would overfit to certain tasks very easily. And we found that Glove gave some interesting effects down the line. But it was really important for us to have the character engram embeddings as well, because for a lot of words in, in some of these tasks, um, there wouldn't be Glove embeddings. Uh, for example, doing translation from English to German, uh, we actually use fixed Glove embeddings on both sides, English and German. Even though Glove was trained on a predominantly English corpus, it had some German words in it, and it, I guess it had enough that this worked out okay, 
with the character embeddings. Um, yeah. Could you briefly explain what a character engram embedding is? Yeah. So this is this is um, yeah. Maybe I should, I should also add a citation to the people that actually did this. Uh, basically, what happened here was they took the same corpus uh, or a similar corpus as Glove, and instead of just treating things as words, tokenized as spaces or coronal p, whatever they used, um, they would separate words into n-grams. So, for example, let's say it's truck. You would, you would take t, uh, you, would, you would take like a special beginning and end word of token, end of word token, and append that to either side of the word. And then you would say like beginning t, beginning tr, beginning tru. These would be all the n-grams, r-u-c, u-c-k. Um, and then you would train basically a word to vec or glove algorithm on top of that using those uh, using those n-grams, summing them together, and then that's the word representation. So this allows you to you know, have some representation for words you've never seen as long as you have n-grams that you've seen, and you can sum them together. And those little three-gram thingies, is that for each character there or something? What's, what's the... Uh... Yeah, so... Yeah, good question. So the uh, the blue little long ellipses here, um, that's the representation for like a word vector in our setup, and or in this figure. And these little dots are you know just entries in a ve in a vector. Um, so those are word vectors. And here, like the glove embeddings are just concatenated to the character embeddings. Um, so you can think of that as whatever your word representation would be. And we experimented with multiple, so we left it kind of vague here as a word vector. And then these are fed through a linear or not, you know, left to experiment, um, a linear layer, and that's fed into a by LSTM, which is shared between the context and the question. And then when we get the outputs of that, we concatenate the original word vector with the outputs. Uh, so there's a skip connection here, and we're feeding that to the rest of the model. So this is like an initial, we call it like an initial encoding of both the question and the context using a shared kind of uh, by LSTM here to try to map them into the same space. Um, we did end up using the linear layer there to kind of shrink the embeddings down a bit. So then there's this section, uh, more dots, more squares, um, where we do a tension between the two sequences. So these, uh, these big you know, rectilinear shapes here, um, with dots in them are basically representing the alignments between the two sequences. So we would do a tension, just a dot product, between each vector in the question sequence with each vector in the context sequence. Um, you get the dot product. So OK, so for example, take the first one, take a dot product with all of the vectors in the context, um, then do a softmax over those dot products to get attention weights, and then use those attention weights to sum over the context vectors. Uh, now we're doing that for every single question with respect to the context and every single context vector with respect to the question vector. This is what in question answering is typically called like something like co-attention after we feed these um, weighted summation representations into uh, you know, another layer of an LSTM or something like that. Um, yeah. So this was this was the, this particular variant was called co-attention. People call it by attention. Any kind of alignment between the two sequences. And then we're again we're we're adding a skip connection here to kind of accumulate these representations. So at this point, though, when I mentioned the that we would maybe feed it through another by LSTM or something like that, we actually separate these. These aren't shared anymore. So at this point, they're they're kind of like two channels. Um, the context and the question were kind of blended together and conditioned on each other, but then we allow for two channels here uh, for, the rest of, for the rest of the model. Um, and this is really just a sequence of things that are uh, you know, creating more compact, more general representations, we're hoping, something like that. These are just extracting higher level features. Um, the self-attention layers here, which if anyone's familiar with the transformer, this is identical to a transformer encoder layer. So this has no recurrence. It's just doing attention. But instead of doing the question, like the first question word vector with all the context vectors, we're doing the first question vector with all of the other question vectors. So that's why this is called like a self-attention 
layer, and then there's a feed forward after that. Um, and then there's one last layer of a BioLSTM. And uh, you know, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these things have kind of peculiar, peculiar motiva motivations. Like we have the BioLSTM right before the cell potential layers, mostly because uh, the representations going into those were so big that we needed a BioLSTM to compress it like bring it down to a lower dimension, otherwise the matrix multiplies in the self attention would give us lots of problems, especially with longer sequences. And then uh, the last, the self attention I'll actually get to, it has like a significant impact on the results, and so does this last BioSTM as well. Actually, I was playing on this with the other day, doing some ablations, and it turns out uh, if I take that away, um, I actually lose uh, on some specific tasks. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the encoding process. Now we have these two sequences, uh, one for the context, one for the question. Hopefully they have information from each other. And then we're going to run an autoregressive decoder. Um, so all this means is you know, we're going to output a word one at a time. And then before we output the next word, we're going to have the model you know, uh, read in the last word in some sense so that it knows what it said. Uh, so we're going to do some input feeding, if people are familiar with that term. And uh, everything's going to depend on the previous state. Again, these are fixed glove and character embeddings on this side. And these, these, two these three layers here kind of line up with the last three layers of the encoder. So um, this is two layers of a transformer decoder and then LSTM decoder. Uh, and this is these stack up so that these actually have access not only to the final output states, but also to the intermediate representations there. Um, and this one will work over the, the final BioLSTM states. And OK, so there's more attention here. Um, and this is how we're going to choose which word we output. Uh, we, we read in uh, an initial token to get started. And then we produce some output state using our LSTM at the top. And we use this state to do attention, so just dot products and weighted summations over the context and the question. That gives us some, some intermediate states. But this attention itself, we have the context attention and the question attention. And these we're going to use uh, for our pointers as well. So just in case people aren't familiar with like, the concept of a pointer, um, when we get our attention weights, this is a, after the softmax, these are you know, between 0 and 1. And they all sum up to 1. And uh, we're just going to treat that as a weight for that particular word and add it to the final probability of outputting that word. So we have a normal softmax output layer for a seek-to-seek -seek model. This is you know, just 50,000 words that we found were very likely. Um, but when the model decides to generate those, we're also going to add in uh, a certain amount of weight based on how much attention we paid to those words as well. And this is going to allow us to copy words directly from the context and the question, even if they're not in this vocabulary. Because we'll actually extend this vocabulary with any words that are, that are in this current example or, or mini batch. Um, let's see. How yeah. Is the output vocabulary given all the different languages and maybe specialized tokens for some tasks? Yeah, so this, the external vocabulary that we used is 50,000 tokens. Um, and this is all word level. <coughs> Sorry? How many languages is that? There's two languages. Well, I mean, SQL, maybe you could count as a third. Um, so but it's, it's really three. Just the, um, like one language pair. It's just English to German. Right. Yeah. And uh, that's also some, some ongoing work on like, what it looks like to incorporate multiple languages here. And, uh, and obviously, that leads to complications with your, your vocab, um, with your external softmax. It's OK for us here because we're only doing one language pair and because most of the tasks actually rely mostly on copying using the pointers. So anytime we have a document that uh, has words that aren't in here, this is going to be a lot of German words because we need them. Um, we're, we're OK. But yeah, if you had you know, 50 languages, um, I imagine you'd have to move to a different approach that's not word level. That's my first reaction uh, if you don't want to deal with a huge softmax. 
All right. So that's, that's basically how the model works. Um, one of the other problems that we had with this was all of these tasks are evaluated differently. Uh, so it's, it was kind of a, a beast of a problem in its own right to just say, how do we evaluate this um, and, and, and get all of that working? And uh, we tried to just make as few decisions as possible so we didn't get in people's way. Um, each task uh, has its own metric. I'll just note here exact match for uh, tasks like multi-NLI or SS uh, Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank. Um, that's just the same as accuracy, you know, at this at this level. If you were using something like the normalized version, it would be slightly different. But this, this these boil down to accuracy. Um, blue and rouge are pretty standard for for those tasks. Uh, I'll mention that CF1 is a corpus level F1 metric because the zero shot relation extraction task is a little different in that its test set is designed to do zero shot. So any of the relations that are seen during training are not seen during testing. Um, so that's the sense in which that's a zero shot task. And it has to be corpus level because sometimes the, um, sometimes the question is unanswerable. The relation might not be in the context at all. So you have to be able to say, OK, these are the relations, or there are none. And uh, so we have a, a corpus level F1 for that. Woz, or the Wizard of Oz uh, dialogue data set, is using like a dialogue state exact match. Um, how this task works is you, have a, you basically have a dictionary uh, with keys of certain kinds, uh, like food. What kind of food does the user want? What kind of um, price range do they want? And you're just mapping these um, predefined keys to values that the user is filling in. And uh, we actually do exact match over that dictionary. So you need to get that entire dictionary correct. WikiSQL is similar. Um, it's a logical form exact match where you want to make sure that it's not just your, your a spurious query. You want to actually make sure that the, the query itself is, is correct for some reasons. And for, for us, because we wanted to keep it simple, we just take the sum of these. And that's you know, the, the decathlon score. So the total final output you know, metric for our model is this decathlon score. Now I'm going to throw a bunch of numbers. And uh, we'll go through this slowly, slide by slide. But there are a bunch of numbers. And uh, we'll plot some insights. So just to go over abbreviations, sequence to sequence model, uh, when I added those self-attention layers, then when I split the sequence, so for the first two, the context and the question are actually just concatenated together. I guess like that for you guys. Um, but it doesn't matter. And then once we move to the co-attention and plus Q pointer model, which just is the same thing as the MQAN, um, then we actually split those apart and we have a co-attention mechanism working over two sequences. So this is kind of comparing you know, a single sequence approach to a, a two sequence approach. Uh, so let's see. Let's start pulling things out. Uh, the first thing that stood, stood out to me when I, I looked at this table was that the, the transformer layers, the self-attention layers, actually help a ton, um, especially on the WikiSQL task, the semantic parsing task, which is mapping uh, user queries to uh, SQL database queries. Um, and I was talking to someone about this recently, uh, and it seems they, they had more. They were they were more historically a semantic parsing person. They're like, oh yeah. There's this one feature that people would typically use in the past that says, you know, is this uh, word in the schema of the table? Is it a column name? Or is this column name in the question? And this was apparently a very useful feature. And I imagine the self-attention here is doing something very similar to that. It's matching, because the question, uh, the question that we're trying to translate into SQL also has with it, uh, like Drew was getting at, all the symbols that it would need to do SQL. So it has all the special C symbols for SQL, like select, where, max. Um, and then it also has all of the column names of the table that it's operating over. So you can do the self-attention and find out some nice alignment between whether like a particular word, like the number of players or a phrase, is, is in the question and in the column names or the set of column names, the schema of the table you're working with. And once you have that, 
I, I think that's why this is very useful. Um, it was also extremely helpful for squad, which um, is the question answering task. And this makes a lot of sense. Same reasoning for SRL, which is the semantic role labeling, um, because those two are kind of the most naturally question answering. Like they, they most depend on the question itself for a lot of the information uh, on, in what you want to do. Uh, so the self-attention there is really important because these, sen these sequences are just concatenated and you don't have the co-attention that normally does this in kind of a, a nice like engineered way. Uh, so you need the self-attention to do that. And it, it you know, helped in the multitask, multitask setting as well. Um, let's see. So like I was saying, QA and SRL, which is the semantic role labeling, um, these had a strong connection in terms of just transfer between those two. And if you, if you just run those two by themselves, you'll actually see a lot of this transfer as well. Um, the same thing goes for squad and, and uh, zero shot relation extraction. Um, but we'll get to that in a sec. So these, these ones highlighted here are showing why pointing to the question was essential for us. Uh, in multi-NLI, this is a natural language inference task where you have a premise and a hypothesis, so two sequences, and you want to find out whether, uh, like what the entailment relationship or the inference relationship is between those two. Does the premise entail the hypothesis? Does, it, uh, does the hypothesis contradict the premise or are they neutral with respect to each other? And uh, in this case, this is, this is kind of similar to sentiment where we would include in the question, is this you know, an entailment, a contradiction, or a neutral relationship? And it was really important for us for some reason to be able to match between the two sequences, like question answering, but then also point to those, um, those answers. So that's why you can see even when we go, when we switch to co-attention from the self-attention, we don't have the question pointer yet. So that means when they're concatenated, the self-attention and the original pointer can, the context pointer can still point to the question because it's concatenated to the context. But once you split them, but you don't have a question pointer, you can't point to the words entailment neutral or contradiction anymore, which is really important for constraining your answer space. Um, and the same thing actually goes for the Winograd schemas, which are kind of common sense questions like who was helping who? And then it's like, okay, Jane was helping John um, and things like that. So again, wherever the constraining the answer space was important, it was really important to be able to point to the question. The zero shot relation extraction was particularly helped by uh, the multitask setting. And most of this comes from doing it with squad. Um, what's interesting about doing this setup is that there are lots of different transfer relationships that I'm, I'm actually in the process of breaking down and drilling down into. But uh, it's funny to see that even when we train these models, uh, like a single model and all these has together, um, you tend to see all of those benefits happening at the same time rather than them fighting for resources. And the fact that you know these, uh, these are actually a small drop from their single task performance, and in some cases better, in some cases the same, is pretty interesting now because we're doing 10 tasks with the same capacity. All, all of the capacity between the single task and multitask setting were, were, was kept constant. Um, so there's some sort of sharing or implicit uh, compression or something happening in there. And it would be really interesting. I don't actually have a good way of analyzing what exactly is happening there, but um, it would be really interesting if someone could come up with a way to figure it out. Nonetheless, there is a, there is a gap between, you know, if you, if you added up all the single task models and you just said you had an oracle that could just tell you which one to run, um, there is a gap. Uh, the gap is not as big now, but, you know, that's uh, I don't know, I originally. Like it's hmm? like for a lot of the tasks, it's pretty easy to tell. Like yeah, what's yeah. And, uh, this number in particular was, a lot of this came down to just figuring out how to train it, uh, train all the things together. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about that as well. We, we mainly experimented with two different kinds of training, something I'll call fully joint and something that's like anti-curriculum or pre-training. So with fully joint, what we're doing is we're training all the tasks together, giving them kind of a uniform distribution over your samples. 
and uh, every single mini batch comes with uh, examples just from one task. Um, so this looks a lot like you know just sampling from each task. A mini batch comes from one task though. We don't mix mini batches. Um, this is to make sure that the number of updates given to a specific task is controlled rather than some fuzzy number of uh, examples. And we found that this was actually really important. Um, it's more about the iterations and the gradient updates than the number of examples from any particular task you see. I'll even mention that we do dynamic batching, so a batch of sentiment might have 500 examples and a batch of summarization might have 16. Um, yeah, just to uh, you know. So then anti-curriculum, um, this would be when we kind of order the tasks by difficulty based on some notion of difficulty that depended on how long it would take to get that model to converge in the single task setting. And uh, we would basically train the harder tasks back and forth for a while, and then we would go to like our, our another. I'll back up a sec. I see some, some puzzled faces. So we would say A and B are harder. Something like squad and translation takes way longer to converge than sentiment, which uh, converges you know, within a few thousand iterations. Uh, so we're going to basically train the harder tasks first, um, and it's a form of pre-training and transferring in a way, but all wrapped together. So we're going to do squad, then MT, then squad, then MT, and then after some number of rounds of doing that, then we'll move on to our, our easier tasks. Um, and it turned out this was actually really important for us too. Uh, so here I've kind of added another column here. This alone, just training on QA first for about 75,000 iterations, and then switching, so kind of pre-training on question answering, um, will give us like a much, uh, gives a, a pretty decent gain uh, on the DECA score. All right. So now I'll dig a little bit into some of the analysis. Um, this, uh, this figure, uh, what you're seeing here is at every single time step, you know how we generate words one by one? This is the proportion of the time that the model is either going to generate from the external vocabulary, that's blue, point to the context and just copy, that's red, or point to the question and copy from the question, that's green. And this is essentially just showing that the model has no trouble um, determining what it should do in the decoder side. Uh, for squad, it always copies from the document, and we know for squad the answer is always in the document. For Classification or Winograd schemas, the answer is in the question somewhere, so you, you point there. And for the generation tasks, it generates. Yeah. All right. Um, we also found that uh, if you basically if you train on the decathlon and then you uh, try some other new task, something that you've never done before, um, if it's related, like English to Czech after training English to German or even if it's not related, something like named entity recognition. Again, formulated as question answering. But we still found that training on the decathlon uh, and then moving those model weights over gave you a better initialization point than just random. Um, one of the follow-up experiments that we've done is, you know, okay, well, if I, what if I do this with something like, um, sentiment or natural language inference where I can uh, train a single model just on uh, like multi-NLI, one, one data set, and then test it on SNLI. And it turns out that with the decathlon model, what we would see is, okay, you can, you can do the, the other sentiment tasks like pretty well, or the other data sets. Um, and there's essentially no drop off between a sentiment model trained on that task versus a decathlon model trained on that task which is actually int pretty interesting. This is a different data set, kind of this zero shot domain adaptation in a way, and we're not losing anything by adding the other tasks in. But you take the same model, and you also get 62% instead of you know, 0% um, on SNLI without any fine tuning or additional training. And the same, the same thing happens there as well. You know, if, you, if you actually do fine tune, then you'll do better than starting from random, even from a single model. Um, and so this will kind of bring a lot of the things that were asked uh, together as well. We saw some evidence of like zero shot behavior where questions like this, like John had a party but no one came and he was all alone. Is this story sad or happy? Well, it's never seen 
It's never seen a question like this. It's, it's kind of question answering, but it's, it's kind of sentiment. Um, it's not clear which task it really is, um, but it's kind of a blend of a few. And the model is pretty good at this. It will actually be able to do this. And I, I'm not sure exactly what the implications are here, but it seems like there is some small evidence that I want to pursue of like, OK, you know, uh, we can get some generalization like between the space of tasks. And uh, just in summary, summarization slide. So since we're short on time, I'll, I'll skip that. But our answer to the original motivation was, we think that a single multitask model is a good direction to go. If you really zoomed out even further, maybe a single multitask, multimodal model. But we really think that the multitask learning is, is a big blocker. This is obviously based on you know, a lot of work um, that came before us. And uh, there's also a few resources online. Um, we have a website up that describes uh, all of this, uh, with all the code is open source, of course there's the paper, and you can email me as well. So that, that's all for me. We have time for questions. Um, I should also say I apologize Papa John's let us down and people came late. Um, after the question answering session, if you want to grab some food on the way out, you're, you're welcome to it since we promised you it. Uh, but we have about 10 minutes now for questions, and so please. Yeah. So the last yeah. example, really short. Uh, you weren't sure whether it was a, like, it's not clear that it was a question answering task or a sentiment classification task. Yeah, this one. Does the model get to see such examples during training as well? No. That, that's, that's the interesting thing. Like, this is something that I trained the model. And then we were like, OK, let's give it a little story and then ask some questions about it. Um, now, we kind of we played around this with a little bit. Like, we made sure that is this story sad or happy is the question so that it, we can test whether it's going to point to the answer, even though it's never had to point to sad or happy in this context before. It does that pretty effectively. Yeah. And since the question is the representation of the task in your model, mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, I haven't looked at sentence level representations of the context or the question. Uh, all our word embeddings are fixed, so it wouldn't be very helpful to do it at that level, but at the sentence level, maybe, or maybe at like higher levels. Um, this is actually where it becomes important that we also use pre-trained kind of fixed embeddings as well, because you know we have a glove vector for sad and happy, and if we actually take all of the sentiment data and we just we don't use positive and negative. We just replace positive with um, happy and negative with sad. It'll lose a couple percent, but it still works just as well if you like remap the labels. And then the ones that it misses are usually kind of ambiguous. It's like, well, that's not a perfect mapping between sad, happy, positive, and negative. So um, it's actually quite intuitive how it's learning to work with glove vectors or learn with the vector space that it's given um, and then can, can get some of this behavior. Yeah, yeah, I I haven't, but I think it would be cool if if you could find something. Yeah, yeah. What's up? Um, so, what would the process of adding a new task just look like? So, um, you said that the whole point of this was basically take it, uh, have this go be from X Y to X T Y, where you have the task description with the name. Mm -hmm. um, so, does this method sort of give us any advantage over just having say? Mm -hmm. Which model do I point to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think this is a good question. And this kind of comes back to the like, task ID question that Drew was asking as well. Um, I think the, on a conceptual level, it's not clear how I would do something like this with a bag of models. Like Maybe you could do it, but it's not clear like, which model in your bag to route this to. Um, this example being like this kind of out of domain, out of task setup. Um, starting from a decathlon train model and working on a new task is helpful in the sense that if you can frame that task as question answering, you can apply it kind of out of the box and get you know more. So if I take a decathlon model 
and versus the same model that's not trained on it, I would expect it to be more robust to like different kinds of inputs the way that I uh, mentioned with multi-NLI and SNLI. It wasn't trained on SNLI at all, but it gets you know 62%, which isn't great, but it's better than zero if you didn't know what to do with that. Now, the follow-up experiments I mentioned uh, in response to Drew's question has a lot to do with this, because I think this is, um, this is one of the things that I really want to explore further. Like, what can we get out of having task descriptions rather than just task IDs? And uh, I think that's going to require me to um, you know, have variations of the question. I think that really limits, limits the model in a sense. Yeah. But as, as far as just adding a task yourself, you, know, um, you can always you can do that pretty easily in the code base if you wanted. And experiment with um, transferring to that task or doing some continual learning with that task. All of these things are very easy in the setup. So you're asking about like uh, an analysis of the activations? Yeah, so this is a great question. Um, and it kind of comes, I'll, I'll kind of throw this back at the crowd too. At the time, I wasn't entirely sure of how to, how to do that analysis. Like, how to, and like if I just plot the activations themselves, that's kind of, uh, I feel like there's variance across even just training the model multiple times. Um, or even, even different kinds of examples. So that wasn't totally clear. Um, there are a few other methods that have come out recently that I've been exploring. But if anyone has like, uh, concrete suggestions or thoughts on that, um, I'm actively looking for, for feedback on that. Yeah. Or if you want to collaborate or something, um, very open to that as well. For example, yeah. let's say that we don't have a task uh, like arithmetic operations there, and suddenly the agent is asking, let's say, 1 plus 1 equals what? Will I do that? No, I never tried examples like that. Um, I, I would be surprised if it did well on that, uh, if it's not trained on anything like it. Um, I guess I'll have to leave it there, because I, I, I would be surprised if there was some truly just emergent behavior that couldn't be attributed to some convex hole of the task it's trained on. Um, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll go play with that. I, I expect not to get much out of that. I feel like, I feel like it's you know, exploring the space between tasks um, more than completely different distributions altogether. Just to piggyback on the convex hole question, and yeah. to follow up on this line of questioning about task representations. So yeah. there's a one word task representation, and you've that would be just a separate model or a mixture model mm -hmm. based on task IDs. You've gone with a task representation which is based on a question. Mm -hmm. Is it clear that natural language English questions are the right representations for tasks? Like you would mm -hmm. want something that has that spans a large basis or some space, uh, you want some basis functions or some basis representations of things that you want to do with some modularity, some comp compositionality. It's clear that. English or languages have compositionality and it forces you to think about you know, words that are similar to other words and you can recombine them. But do you need natural language? Like why not just have your tasks be composed of some modules or some things that are posed together and that's the input. And mm -hmm. that also gives you a, an entire grammar of the possible tasks that can be solved, but you only see examples of a subset of that grammar. Hmm. Yeah, this is interesting. Um, I suppose I, I'm. I guess part of the, part of the hypothesis with this whole project is that um, I want to explore the research direction of finding out whether our language is capable of doing this for us. Um, so it's not clear. It's not. It's not clear to me. There's nothing in here that definitively proves that task descriptions using natural language questions are, are the best way to represent tasks. I don't think. Um, I think there's some promising stuff. I'm not sure, for example, if I had multiple modules, um, how they would, how I would get them to, to cover everything that I would want to ask and all the different ways that I would want to ask. To me, 
any time that I'm going to be describing a task to a model, like I, in some sense, I'm going to have a natural language description in my head about that, and I would want it to work with that and not have me uh, hard code it. But I get, but one of the advantages of maybe doing it that way is that you get to have all of this kind of task specific or task specific modules and sub modules. Um, there's a trade off there, and I, I'm not sure. I'm hoping, I'm hoping to get more out of this direction. But yeah, I'd love to talk more about that too. Thank Brian. Thank you.